the notion of voice is essentially how you sound. It's important to read things out loud. It's a thousand little choices that you make all along the way that over time grow your voice and add up to something that's wholly unique. Find those small moments. Those small moments are the things that become a big differentiation for yourself. In this episode, I talk to Anne Hanley. Anne is the Chief Content Officer for Marketing Profs. She's been around the content marketing online business space for a long time, since 1999. Uh, she's been running a newsletter for the last three years and a lot of really interesting things. Uh, she's also a really well-known public speaker. So in this episode, we talk about a whole range of things, like what she thinks of the multiple rises of email newsletters over the years, the trend email is dead, the balance between email and social media platforms, we get into algorithms. Uh, we talk about really a whole range of things. Probably my favorite is when we get into uh, talking about style and voice and how you write, how to make things fun. Her newsletter is called Total Anarchy. Anarchy is spelled like her name. And so you can give a, that gives you an idea of uh, the way she likes to write, uh, the energy and, and you know passion that she brings to uh, business and marketing topics. So anyway, with that, I'll get out of the way and let's dive into the show. And thanks for joining me. I am delighted to be here. Thank you for having me. So I want to start with something that has nothing to do with email newsletters. And it is just a shared love that you and I both have that I discovered in research. And that is for tiny house offices. Oh, really? Yeah. So I'm in my tiny house office that I built a year ago. I got it finished just before COVID, uh, which was good timing. Uh, and if I understand correctly, you had a tiny house office built uh, like six or seven years ago. Yeah, this is it. Yes, I was. It was uh, turned out to be a prescient move because <laughs> who knew? Um, this is very. So I'm in my tiny house office right now. It's in my backyard. Um, and yes, I built it I don't know, six or seven ish years ago, something like that. Um, and I built it at the time as a sort of place where I thought I can come and do my best work. It's, you know, small enough that it's just me in here, me and my, and my little dog who's, who's here with me now. Um, little tiny porch on the front and, uh, and, a, and a hardwire internet connection. And that's it. So I built it as a place to really, as I said, do my best work as a place to write, essentially, um, that was just sequestered from everybody else that, that I couldn't hear anybody breathe back here. Um, it was just, you know, 100% perfect. And then you know, for fast forward, COVID happens and suddenly my tiny house is now thrust onto the international stage. It's, you know, now the backdrop for all of these online programs that I'm doing, which is fine. Just that I kind of had to clean things up a little bit. So, um, <laughs> so yeah, it's kind of been forced into the, the white hot lights of the internet suddenly in the tiny house. It's doing its best back here, but this is not necessarily what it was built for originally. <laughs> Yeah, so it sounded, started more as like sort of the writing writing shed, backyard office kind of thing, and and now it's the working full time. Yeah, exactly. I mean, you know, so I marketing process. My company has all, we've always been one hundred percent virtual. So I have a an office in the big house where I live. A lot of people think I live in a tiny house. I do not live in a tiny house. <laughs> um, it's a tiny house office only. So I live in a, a regular size house. And I have an office there too, and um, and I use that mostly, you know, like in the in the deep winter. It, it this place is not insulated, as you can tell by the plywood background here. Again, this was supposed to be just for me. I didn't understand that this was yeah. going to be. Who knew, you know, that it was going to be uh, subjected to the internet on a daily basis at this point. Um, but yeah, so it's uh, it essentially built it, you know, for me, just as a place to to come back when I really just needed some space and some quiet. Um, but you know, it actually turns out to be probably like the best investment I ever made as a writer. It's just been such a gift to have this place back here, um, and you know, even in in you know pre-pandemic times that was true, but especially now, because it does feel like it's a world away from anything going on, not just in my house, but in my town and my state and my community, anything beyond it, you know? So it's kind of nice just to have this one place that as a writer, as a creator, you can feel like, all right, it's all mine. Oxygen is back here, you know? I like that. Yeah. For me, I, my tiny house office is just across the backyard, um, from my house and, and I have three little kids. Uh, and so mm -hmm. getting outside the house, my old office is now 
our one-year-old's room and like he, he can have that space i can have this space and yeah it's perfect. yeah so i think we'll see a lot more people uh, build out tiny house offices or you know backyard things it's a good trend yeah exactly and in really creative ways too like uh, my friend jeremiah ao yang has a, is a, a digital consultant um he speaks a lot about you know the what, what's next the future of of digital of the de- digital evolution essentially um, and he put an airstream in his backyard that he retrofitted with, um, you know, as, as an office. So, you know, there's all kinds of different ways to do it. We did a clubhouse a couple of weeks ago, um, Jeremiah and I, and I did, in which we, we had people, you know, we invited people to talk about their own sort of backyard offices. People have crazy stuff, you know, not even, you know, structures like, like I'm in or what looks like, like you're in, like wooden structures. Yeah. But, you know, in addition to airstreams, they have tents, they have, you know, sheds that have been repurposed. I mean, all kinds of crazy things. Um, so, yeah, it's definitely, definitely a trend. Yeah, I have a friend, Nat Eliason, who has a space out in Austin, Texas, and he's set, like permanently set up his, his office on his back deck. You know, and I guess it's covered. I hope it's covered. I don't know, <laughs> you know, but like he's like wiping the dust off his monitor and getting to work in it. You know, I like it. And then uh, uh, James Keller, who's our VP of product at, at ConvertKit, she was at uh, working on the Firefox team before joining us. But she does the same thing where she like camps out on her back deck. Oh, like, that's amazing. As much time as possible. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, I'm in Boston, so that's a little tricky to do, except for, you know, certain months of the year. Um, and for me, it doesn't solve that problem of, like, in some ways, that puts me more in the middle of everything. And right. I think that especially in a, you know, in the midst of a pandemic, but even, you know, even going beyond as the nature of, you know, as we're, we're thinking about offices a little differently now, just having a place where you can do some focused work, I think is just so important right now. And as much as I appreciated it pre-pandemic, you know, I never, I, I didn't quite appreciate it at the depth that I do now because just being in this space, just you know, it just feels it feels so good. Yeah. Um, and I encourage anybody who is a, a writer, a creator, anybody who does focused work of any kind, which is basically you know any knowledge worker, just think about you know how do you create this sort of environment for yourself. For me, it's really been a game changer. Yeah, I love it. Well, I want to ask about something that's maybe a little bit selfish for me, which as the podcast interview, I'm, uh, I'm allowed to do. Um, it's in the handbook. Uh, you have this interesting world of your own newsletter, and then you also have marketing props. Can you talk about the intersection between those two things? And part of the reason I ask is I'm in that same space of like ConvertKit is a much bigger company than, you know, me individually. But then I also have like my own newsletter and podcast, and I often kind of try to figure out the interplay between those two things is they definitely serve each other, but then are sometimes unrelated. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. Um, yeah, it's something that I've actually thought a lot about. So, you know, I've been at marketing profs, um, I'm a partner in marketing profs. I've, I've been with the company almost since day one, um, since 2002. So that's like what 19 years that I've 19 years this spring that I've that I've been part of marketing profs. Yeah. And then prior to that, I, I I've had a startup called clickz.com, which some people still remember. It's still around, still offering online marketing advice to to um, all kinds of businesses. So I've been in this space for a very long time, you know, associated with a brand that was kind of bigger than me, essentially. So been at Marketing Prof since, as I said, last 19 years. And then, you know, the thing that happens as you go further along in your career and not necessarily, you know, 19 years into it, but I think it happens, you know, pretty quickly as you're, as you're, as a company you're with grows is that when I, you, you start touching things less. Like when I first started at Marketing Profs in 2002, the newsletter was me. Any content on the website was me. I was the chief content officer. I touched every single thing. I literally was, you know, putting together newsletters and sending it to our production person so that she could then, you know, mail it out to our list. I was touching it, all of it. Um, and then as your career goes on, like I touched it less and less and less. And I found that it was a, it, in some ways it was great because it freed me up to do more, you know, higher level things to more strategic things. But at the same time, I touched it less. And so I got out of that day-to-day grind, so to speak. And I mean that in a good way. Like I didn't know what it was like to really be in the trenches as a marketer, putting together 
things that, you know, I, I, that are, how do you grow an audience in, you know, in, right. in the modern age? I mean, I knew what I did in 2002 and three and four, but like, so to stay relevant, to stay sharp and to also just stay in it because that's the fun part for me, you know, <laughs> the, like as much as I love the strategy piece and, you know, the, the thinking piece and the managing piece and all of that stuff, at the same time, like I, I love making things. I love touching things. And so I, I thought to myself, you know what I need? I need a little bit of a reboot, right? I need to do things on my own. Um, and so never mind the fact that I had, you know, books and I had a speaking career, like all of that was fine and great and, and going well. I didn't necessarily need, in this case, a newsletter, right? But I wanted something that I could make. Like I just felt that real need to do something and to communicate with an audience. I miss that one-to-one -one community. Um, and so three years ago, I thought, all right, what can I do? And so, you know, I thought maybe I should do something where people can see my face. Like maybe I should do a podcast like this, or maybe I should do a Facebook live regular series, or maybe I should do an Instagram live or any number of things that I could have done. Um, and now of course the choices are even bigger, right? I can just do like, like I can do a, a clubhouse room. I can do, you know, all kinds of things or all kinds of channels, but I realized that essentially I'm a writer and my background is in newsletters, it's in writing. And before I was in marketing, before I was in newsletters, I was a journalist. And so building an audience and thinking about what does an audience need from me is kind of in my DNA. And so I wanted to do that. I thought, you know what, I'm gonna do that. And I'm gonna find out what is it like to build an audience now? What does it take to put together a, a program? Like, how do you actually work with an email service? Like, I was so far out of it, you know, <laughs> you know that I just didn't do that anymore. Yeah. Um, and so it was really fun. I actually have learned a whole lot about, you know, what, what is, how do, how do you connect with an audience these days? Um, and just to go back to your original question about like, how do you balance the two? They very much feed into one another. You know, if you are on my Anne Handley Total Anarchy list, you see that I reference my work at Marketing Profs. It's not a, a publication of Marketing Profs. Like it's, it's not a mouthpiece for it or just another channel for Marketing Profs by any stretch. It's all mine. But there are some things that are I think would be interesting to my audience. The other differentiator is that Marketing Profs is a, you know, we have an email newsletter that we publish three times a week that it's squarely focused on B2B digital marketing of all kinds. So you can be an event marketer at, um, at I don't know, Cisco, or you can at the Adobe Summit and you can subscribe to the Marketing Props newsletter and find something there for you. But you wouldn't necessarily find as much of that in my own newsletter because my newsletter focuses on almost exclusively on writing, on content and on just, you know, the things that, that bring me joy. Um, I got a, I got a, a note this morning from a subscriber who recently lost her job. And she said that she was resubscribing with her personal email address because she lost her job. And, you know, that email address obviously was going away. And she said, I subscribe to, you know, learn from you, obviously. But she said, the real reason that I subscribe is because you bring me joy. You make me in a good mood whenever I read your newsletter. And I just thought, God, like, how do you put a metric on that? <laughs> you know, yes. you don't necessarily get that on the marketing process side of things because that's not the intent. But that kind of is the intent on my side of things. Um, so that's kind of a long winded answer. But I think the two feed one another, not necessarily in um, in a direct way, but some, actually, that's not true. Sometimes in a direct way, because when you sign up for my email newsletter, it says like, here's what you're going to get here. If you're looking for more general marketing advice, you might consider signing up for marketing process. And I have a, um, you know, a subscribe link there as well. So it, it does, you know, feed marketing props to some degree. Um, but you know, my focus is much narrower. I only publish every other week. It's fortnightly. Um, and so just the, 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 what I do is different. And from a psychic standpoint for myself, it's, it's so important to me just to be able to stay in the game, so to speak. Yeah, that makes sense. So you talked about coming, you know, back into the like building your own audience world three years ago. I'm curious, what were some of those things that either surprised you or really stood out to you as having changed from the previous time that you'd done it? You know, we grew the marketing profs list a lot through co-registration. So through partners, essentially. You know, the marketing profit list is massive. It's 600 and something, 100,000. I mean, it's, you know, it's a big list. And it's also been around for, you know, 20 years, right? So it's a, it's a, a legacy product at this point in terms of the list. 
Um, so it's pretty significant, but we were able to grow it way back then from co-registration deals with you know some some partners at the time, some of whom are, are still around. Um, I didn't do any of that this time because for a couple of different reasons. Um, but one of the reasons is because I, 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 I wanted it to be, I wanted to grow the list more organically. And I also just wanted it to be a relationship with me ultimately that would grow that list. And so, you know, in that, in that way, a co-registration deal with like somebody like you, for example, like say that you said, you know, someone sign, sign, is signing up for, you know, Nathan's list. And then you're like, Hey, you might want to check out Ann Hanley too. It's like, I don't want that because to me, that's, that's not, what I'm all about, <laughs> you know, um, growth at any cost is kind of not a metric that I, that I want to pursue, or it's not a strategy that I want to pursue. It was different, you know, 20 years ago on, on the marketing cross side of things where we did want to grow quickly and get as much traction as we could right away. So that was one of the things that changed. Um, I would say that another thing that's, um, that's changed at least for me personally is that I, you know, I don't use pop-ups or, um, or anything like that as a way to entice people to sign up for my list. Um, Marketing Props does it, and I'm not saying there's anything wrong with it. There's a lot of brands that do it and you do it quite effectively. But again, it goes back to the goal, right? Of like, what am I all about here? I don't think that that works with my brand, you know? <laughs> you know? So those are just, it's not necessarily something that's changed, but I think it was a shift in me personally where I realized, well, yeah, just because it works doesn't mean that I want to do it because when I put it through that second filter of, okay, so what, number one, you know, it works. Number two, though, do you want to do it? You know, does it work with you? Um, and so adding that second filter on, like, was, was an important takeaway for me. Like, I, I wanted to be able to run things through that before I made a decision about anything. That's interesting because I'm realizing I do the same where if I was giving advice, I would tell people you should have... Um, like a lead magnet or an incentive for people to join your list. Don't just say like, join my newsletter. I send it every week at this time or every other week at this time. I'd be like, you know, give them something right then. But if you go to my own site, I'm like, join my newsletter. I send it every Tuesday yes. because I want people to opt in for the newsletter. And if you need more enticement than that, like where you'd sign up to get something for free and then like kind of lose interest, I actually don't want you on my list because it's like, look, I just want a small group of people that really want to be here. Whereas five years ago, I wanted as many people as possible. Yeah, your goals are different, right? And so, yeah, yeah, I 100% agree with that. Yeah. I mean, I think, you know, it, and it comes down to what are the goals that, that you have in mind for your own for your own growth. And, you know, for me, it's it's a it's a little bit different than it is on, on the marketing prop side of things. And part of that is, is it's like it tracks back to the business model, right? I don't, I'm not doing anything in with the marketing with with the Ann Hanley list other than, you know, communicating with an audience, testing some things, having a little fun, seeing what works, seeing what doesn't, um, you know, using it as a, a so-called thought leadership opportunity for me, keeping in touch with my community, nurturing those relationships like that's all that's all I'm doing. Um, you know, I don't have advertisers that I need to satisfy. So I don't necessarily need a certain size of a list or a click through. I don't need certain segments. I don't need, you know, people in North America who work at companies of over 500 people. Like, I don't need that. It doesn't matter. <laughs> and so, um, so really my goals there are different. And again, like when I go back to, when we go back to like, why did I start this? I started it because I wanted to see what works. And I also just wanted to be creatively, you know, challenged and I wanted to be creatively engaged. And so, those are, um, you know, those are very different goals than actually building a, a business around it, um, which isn't, I mean, I isn't to say that this is not a business, but you know what I'm saying? It's just like the focus is a little bit different. Yeah, that makes sense. So you have over on your site, you say 21,000 people on your newsletter. That seems like the sort of number that I would put on there and then forget to update after a long period of time. So, <laughs> you know, I don't know if it's is that on larger there? now or not. Oh my Lord. Is that really on there? <laughs> it is. Wow. Is that on the newsletter page? Do you have more than that now? Is that a little, a little out of date? Yeah, it's about, yeah, it's like more than half that. I mean, yeah, more than twice that. I mean, wow, that's crazy. Where is that? Is that on the newsletter page? That is on at the end of every post, uh, your subscription form that says get the letter 21,000 people love to get. So it could be that you have 42,000 people, but only 21,000 people <laughs> actually love it. <laughs> that's what we're going to. Yes. Yes. That's what it is. That's intentional. Yeah. Yeah. The other 20,000 are like, nah, 
<laughs> Take it or leave it. So I'm curious what like that's a sizable list. Um, well, I mean, I'm curious what has been working to grow that. What are the channels that have been driving the most growth? The channels that drive the most growth for me are essentially current subscribers. When I at the at, at the end of every newsletter, I say, if you've enjoyed this, you know, pass it along to someone else who, who will also enjoy it. So essentially asking current subscribers or so referrals from current subscribers. Yep. Second thing is um, speaking opportunities. So whether I'm speaking directly about email newsletters or whether I'm just, you know, giving a talk about marketing, I, I always say like, you know, if you, it's a soft, soft approach. It's like, if you liked what you, what you heard today and you want to hear more, um, you know, here's, here's a way to hear from me every other week. And, you know, I always add a, you know, let me know if like how you, how you got here, let me know that you were at this event. Um, that's the, the other way that I do it. Um, and then thirdly is through referrals, not directly of the newsletter, but people talking about it on social media. So sometimes it's me, but more often than not, I kind of forget that I should be promoting this thing, <laughs> which I know is like so lame, but, um, but again, goes back to the goals. So it's other people who, you know, will, will talk about how much value they get from it or how much they love it. And so that's essentially how it's grown. So through, uh, direct referrals to the newsletter itself through speaking opportunities or podcasts like this one sometimes as well. Um, and then the third, the third way is um, my dog is like, wants to get outside and I'll let him out in a second. Um, the third way is through, uh, you know, just social referrals from, from other folks. Okay. So you've been around the newsletter space for a long time. And so you've probably heard like email is dead. Well, my favorite graph is the, like all the, the rise of email, like shown over time, then with all the email is dead, uh, news articles, you know, like New York Times 2014, so something else 20, 2018, whatever. Um, I'm curious about your take on like the recent popularity of newsletters in the last um, 18 to 24 months with the rise of Substack and, and so many journalists leaving to um, start a newsletter, whether on Substack or on any other platform. Um, what's been, a, what, what has it been like watching that change? Um, and then what do you think? Is it one that's going to stay or, or do you feel like it's, you know, just another fad in the moment and in a long trend that will continue? <laughs> yeah. Um, so first of all, I was, so I, I did a webinar last week with an email service provider and as part of my research for that, I was talking about, um, you know, the, the future of newsletters essentially. And as part of my research for that, I went back to the very, very, very first um, email newsletter, or I should say email marketing uh, column that I launched on ClickZ in 1999. And what I, I, so I found it on the ClickZ website and it was all about how like we're launching this brand new column. It's going to be talking about email marketing and how marketers should really be paying attention to this channel. Um, and the, the language in it was really funny. I can send it to you um, if you're interested in, in seeing it, just to add to the show notes or something. Yeah. But the language in it is like, think about your own behavior. It was like, remember, this is 1999. So pre-social media, you know, pre, pre-blogging mostly, like there's some blogs around, but not really, not quite as much. Um, it, and it's pre just everything like if, oh, that we think about now, the world seemed like it was so much quieter. But even back then, I was kind of making the case for email marketing. And I was saying, like, think about your own behavior. Like, what do you check before you go to bed at night? What do you check first thing in the morning <laughs> you know, or within an hour of waking up? And I was making the case for the importance of email. And when I read it, read it, read it last week, I was thinking, God, I could have written this you know, two weeks ago and felt the very same way about it. Right. Um, and so, yeah, it's funny to me just to see email and email marketing and email more generally just being, you know, they, they sound, we as a society or as a culture, I mean, we sound a, a death notice for it just like on a regular basis, you know, it's definitely cyclical where it's like, oh, email's dead now that Clubhouse is here, you know, email's dead now that, you know, um, Facebook is here. Like, it doesn't matter. It's a, there's always something that's going to take the place of it. And I don't think that's true at all. Just, you know, and I'm guessing you don't, <laughs> you don't agree with that either. Um, but yeah, we are in sort of this renaissance of email. And I think there's a couple of things that are driving it. I think partly is because email is the place where, you know, you and I have the opportunity and everybody listening here has the opportunity to communicate directly. 
for as opposed to you know trying to game an algorithm to try to get in touch with our audience more directly you know the promise of social when it first came out was you know facebook was saying oh this is an opportunity for you to speak to your speak to your customers and your prospects directly wouldn't that be fabulous and then it turns out right they're going to control that ability for us to communicate directly and so wasn't quite so direct. The promise was never quite fulfilled, or at least it was there, and then they they sort of yanked it away with a cane. Um, and I think that only gave rise to the fact that you know email being the only place where people and not algorithms are in control. I've talked a lot about that in the past couple of years, um, and that's very much true. And so I think that's one of the reasons why we're seeing you know email being just increasingly part of of the vernacular or part of the mix these days. The second thing, though, is like I, the whole notion or, or the whole, I don't know, the whole, the whole conversation around that when something comes up, another thing dies, it's ridiculous to me. <laughs> you know, it's like, it's like saying that, you know, because TV exists, radio should die. I mean, that's just ridiculous. It just, the world doesn't function that way, right? It's like we figure out a way to make it in addition to, not instead of. Second thing. But the third thing is, I think that the rise of newsletters, just as you mentioned, like the rise of Substack, for example, it's, it's directly tied to creators increasingly just owning their own platforms. And I think we're seeing this not only in the newsletter space, but across everything. And so, you know, newsletters are maybe a place where writers, you know, journalists are, are more comfortable, just like people like you and me, maybe are more comfortable there building our own relationships with our audience. But I don't think it's isolated to newsletters. I think we're seeing it across, you know, across so many, um, so many things. So many creators are just, you know, taking their, taking it into their own hands. That's why we're seeing the rise of Patreon and some other platforms that are helping creators monetize their own audiences directly, as opposed to going through the social platforms. And I think it changes, it changes the game for for creators as well. And I think that's why, why we're seeing it. Um, I mean, the other interesting thing, just to go back to the the uh, the social thing for a second, is I think that's why we're seeing, you know, some. I think some of the social networks are freaking out a little bit, right? <laughs> I think that's why Twitter acquired Review. Yep. Um, you know, Facebook is reportedly building their own newsletter newsletter platform, and then LinkedIn is offering you now the ability to to, to build a newsletter. But it's not really that. It's just using. It's still using their their platforms, and so. If anybody here, and, and I know your audience is pretty sophisticated, so they probably are are very well aware of the fact that they should stay away from those platforms if you want to build your, your own list. Take it upon yourself. Don't do it through one of the social platforms. Yeah, I, I think you're right because the algorithms will play into it. What you were saying about the, the ownership, you know, something we've preached a lot of own the relationship with your audience um, and that being so important. But the other thing that we're seeing across the creator space is – uh, more and more creators owning that content directly. Like we, mm -hmm. for ConvertKit, we've been expanding a lot into music over the last um, year, 18 months or so. And we acquired a company called FanBridge and announced that last week, um, which is email marketing for musicians. And you're seeing that so much in music of before, you know, people um, like individual artists not owning their masters. And now they're being... Right, like Taylor Swift. Yes, my team jokes that I'll work. I'll work Taylor Swift into any conversation. Um, <laughs> I was literally just about to, to bring her up. I was thinking this is exactly the Taylor Swift issue, right? <laughs> so yeah, and, and so you're seeing these creators who used to be at the mercy of whether it be a record label, um, an algorithm, the social platforms, or whatever else, and saying like, "Look, I'm not going to play that game anymore. I'm going to own the relationship, the things that I create." Um, and it, it'll just be fascinating to see it play out in more and more circles. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, for sure. Um, yeah, hundred percent agree. And I, and I think that this is just such an exciting time, I think, to be a creator, to be a newsletter writer, to be a musician, to be an artist of any kind, to be a filmmaker. Cause I do think that we're going to see an explosion of opportunities that we have to yes, own, own our own work, but also own our own audiences, which is a massive, massive shift. Yeah. Something brand new that I'll, I confess to not knowing super well, but that you've been playing in that in that world is sort of the the cryptocurrency, the creator coins. You know, there's NFTs, and and um, now I sound like I'm old and out of the game. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> like I tried to buy, you know, uh, an NFT of someone's writing. I tried to bid on it, and I couldn't even get. I couldn't move the 
cryptocurrencies around properly to, <laughs> to even achieve it. But I'm curious for your take on this space, because you did write about, um, you know, creating the, the word uh, crypto or the uh, word creator coin. And so I'm curious what you think. Yeah, it kind of plays into what we were just talking about a second ago, because I think that, you know, creator coins are, or cryptocurrency is, is another opportunity for creatives to get paid essentially by their, by their communities. You know, if you value somebody's work, you can, the creator coin will allow you to support them in that way. So yes, I launched my own creator coin a couple of weeks ago and, you know, I'm still figuring it out, still figuring out what exactly I'm going to do with it or how I'm going to integrate it into what I do. Um, so I launched the word coin through a platform called rally.io and what rally does is allows creators to launch their own coins. Um, the mantra is kind of like, if you have a community, you can have an economy. And there's different ways that you can reward people in your economy, just, you know, through giving them your own coin. So for example, I could give people who, um, you know, like our long-term subscribers of Marketing Prof, somebody, uh, sorry, part of my own newsletter, um, I could reward them for being, you know, subscribers. Somebody shared on Twitter, I think it was over the weekend, um, that she's been a subscriber for like two and a half years and it's the longest email newsletter that she's ever subscribed to, or that it's the longest time she's ever subscribed to an email newsletter. Yep. And I, you know, tweeted back at her, so I'm going to give you some word coin for that because, you know, so it's rewarding longevity in that case. Um, she could then take that word coin and pass it along to, to somebody else. Um, there are ways that, you know, I can maybe, uh, people can buy create, uh, word coins to get access to like VIP privileges to maybe a consult with me, a shout out in the newsletter. Um, it could be, uh, you know, maybe, maybe just, uh, like a small, um, a small ad in the newsletter. Like there could be any number of, of ways that I think you can use that you can use a creator coin, but, um, but yeah, it's a really, it's a fascinating area and i think one that we're going to hear a whole lot more about especially as you know creators are sort of owning the all the, the content the audiences and, and figure out ways to monetize i think we're going to see you know things like creator coins become increasingly relevant um you know is as this world grows and expands and matures so i did it mostly as an experiment but i also think that you know again just to go back to why did i start the email loser i it's, I needed to get into it to sort of understand how to use it. And so that's essentially what I'm doing there too. It seems to me like launching your own little economy around a coin, you know, in your community would be a fairly big investment, not maybe on the monetary side, but in the, like the time side or yeah. the longevity side of like, Hey, this is just a little experiment now, but for it to be something within our community, like we're going to have to do it for years. Is that something that you thought about it or are you just waiting to see how it shapes up? Yeah, I don't know that you need to do it for years, um, but but yeah, it does take some managing and some strategy and some thought behind it, which is why I'm hedging a little bit when I say that I'm at the very beginning stages of it um, because I just, I launched it a, f a few weeks ago. I haven't, like I will 100% honest with you, I haven't necessarily implemented it in any specific way, but you know, for example, one thing that I could do is like, I could have a page on my website that said, that says like, Hey, you know, you want me to be on your podcast like this, you know, you can buy, you know, 100 word coins or something like that. Um, and so th there could be some very simple ways that I could, you know, implement a program like that. I could, I could, um, offer rewards for referring the newsletter, for example, for growing, you know, the list in that way. Um, and so I don't necessarily think it's it's very complicated or that will take a long time, but you know it will require me to just like honestly just sit down like put my butt in the chair and like think it through a little bit more <laughs> strategically than I have at this very moment in time. So that's all coming, but it's you know it's gonna it's yep. incumbent on me to just kind of make it happen at this point. I have this whole list of things that are kind of like that. You know, yeah. referral system for newsletter is one, and and there's just a bunch of things where it's like these are all ideas I add to them and it's not really worth spending time on it until I can spend like two hours to sit down and really dive in and be like, okay, this is actually what I want to do. I know. Yeah. It's exactly that. Yeah. It's exactly that. It's the, it's a line item that keeps moving forward every week. And I keep thinking I'm going to get to it. And then I just, you know, life happens and whatever. So, yeah, but it'll happen. I'll, I'll get there. It just is going to take me a little bit longer to actually for, for anybody in the audience to sort of see anything, I should say, I'm thinking a lot about it. And, you know, for me, that's, it's always the first start anyway. Yeah.
That makes sense. Um, I want to switch gears a little bit and go to writing specifically, since that's something that you are so well known for. And like, I love the quote of, you know, from that recent reader saying like, I'm in a good mood whenever I read this, you know, and that's, yeah. that is the best testimonial that you can get. So how do you think about tone and voice when you're writing and making it something that people aren't like, Oh yeah, there's another, there's another email from Anne, you know, and said like, Oh, you know, I'm really excited every other week when this comes out. <laughs> yeah, I know. And it actually it did like, it's, it's kind of goofy, but it literally filled my heart. Like when she said that, I was like, no, like I had to take a moment, you know, where I was like, that's yeah. like, I never thought about that. But, you know, I think about the writers who I enjoy reading. That's actually is true. Like what they do for me. Um, and I don't think it's just because of the choice of reading material that I have, like, doesn't mean that it has to, always has to be an uplif uplifting story. But to read something and feel like, God, that was like, I feel so good after reading that. I was like, wow, that's actually a, a nice way to think about what one of my goals for the newsletter, which I hadn't thought about before. So when I think about writing the email newsletter, when I sit down to write it every other week, I think about two things. First of all, I think about one person, which is a little bit of a cliche in writing, and that's a little bit of cliche in marketing, too. But for, for me, it's the only thing that I can do. It, it helps keep my voice conversational. It helps keep my voice um, loose and just, you know, it just reminds me that I'm speaking to one person at one time. And it's true, right? Because it's one inbox, one time. You're not speaking to an entire auditorium full of, of readers who are opening up your newsletter at the very same time when you mail it on, in my case, Sunday mornings. Um, you're speaking to one person at one time. So... You know, I think about just that one person and I'm usually writing to a person based on a challenge or a problem or an issue that came up over the past two weeks. It's something very specific. So, you know, I'll, I'll start out in my head with, you know, like a, like a dear Judith or something like that. I don't actually say that, but I'm writing to that person and it just helps me get into the mindset of the person that I'm trying to help. And that person, of course, is a proxy for the audience, right? It's not the, you know, the more specific I write, the more universal it tends to appeal. And so that's, that's how I approach it. Um, I sit down and I write it straight through, and then I usually do three or four edits on it. And each time I edit, I'm editing for something very specific. The first time it's um, essentially for, you know, am I, is the content clear? Like, am I making the point that I want to make? is, you know, when I look at it from a broader standpoint, I call it editing by chainsaw, right? Is, is do all of these points make sense? Or does this point maybe belong someplace else in a different newsletter or a different piece of content somewhere? Does it belong with the rest? So that's the first pass. Second pass is what I call editing by surgical tools. And I'll go through and think very specifically about each sentence. Does it make sense? Does it earn its keep, so to speak? Um, does it really need to be in this newsletter? I'm hyper aware of the fact that, you know, my newsletter is is long, but, you know, a lot of good newsletters are long. But when someone feels like it's long, that's when I I know I failed, right? And so that's why I'm very particular in an, in the email newsletter, more so than I would be, say, in a book. You know, I wouldn't necessarily go through and think about each sentence. Does it earn, it, does it earn its keep with quite the same kind of, you know, strictness, but, um, yep. but I do it in an email newsletter because I'm very aware of that and I want it to feel tight and concise and not a word is wasted. And then the fourth, um, so that's the third pass. And then the fourth pass is for voice. And I go through and I read it out loud at that point. And I think, does it sound like me? Could I add a little more humor in? Could I make it sound a little bit more fun, funny? In some cases, I'll add in some asides. That's the moment where, you know, if, as I say, like if you covered up the, the from line on the, you know, in your email client, you know, would it sound like me or could it come from Nathan, right? Does it sound like it came from Nathan or does it sound like it came from Anne? So I want to make sure that it really does sound like me. And so reading it out loud really helps with that. But then also just thinking about, you know, thinking about voice, um, you know, more, more specifically as, as relates to me. So that's kind of my process that I go through. And some of that voice comes down to, as I said, humor it comes down to word choice. A lot of times it even comes down to the greeting at the very beginning. Like I start every email newsletter, usually with some kind of crazy, like, Hey, sassafras, or, you know, hello, sweet petunia, like some of that kind of stuff, you know, just in a way to, to differentiate to, again, to sound like me and not like anybody else. Well, I think that's a good line. And I've heard you mention it in a few of your talks of, if I were to take your, you know, your website, your writing, whatever it is, and cover up your logo and any identifiable brand elements, 
then like, could we, could we know that it's you? Um, and I think that's something that a lot of writers struggle with of like, okay, this is useful information that I'm giving you. This is, you know, maybe it served its purpose. It's made it through the chainsaw edit. Um, what are some tips that you would have for someone who is looking to add in a lot more voice and personality? How do you coach people through that? I don't know. Like I, sometimes I, I struggle with this whole conversation around voice because I feel like people think that it's something that they try on, you know, but it's, it's not something that you step into. It's something that sort of grows on you, which is kind of a gross analogy. Now that I think about it, I make it sound like a mole <laughs> or like, I don't know, some kind of wart. It's not that. Um, but you know, the, 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 the notion of voice is essentially just how you sound and, you know, it's not any more complicated than that. And so when I coach people on voice, um, that's why I think it's important to read things out loud because very often that's the step that even now, I mean, I've been writing for, you know, since I was eight years old and I wanted to be a writer, you know, so I've been writing for a long time. And even now when I read things out loud, I, I sound like not me. And that's the point where I was like, God, you know, that I could do better than that. You know? So it's just, it, I think developing a voice is less a big, big thing that you like. It's not, it's like, it's not a platform that you step onto. It's a thousand little choices that you make all along the way that over time grow your voice and add up to something that's wholly unique. So find those small moments, like those small moments are the things that become a big differentiation for yourself. What are, so you mentioned the greetings. What are a few of the other small, small moments in your own writing? Um, one of the things that I do a lot is a callback. So I'll start out talking about something, you know, so again, I write it as a letter. That's, that's another piece of when we're talking about how do I write the, the newsletter? I focus less on the news and more on the letter. So it's a one-to-one -one conversation with, with a, yeah. um, with a reader. And so I focus on, so I'll tell, I'll usually start out with like a story, just like you would if you're writing a letter to a friend or something like that, not an email, but a letter to a friend, right? Um, you know, it's like, Hey, how's it going? What, you know, this, what's going on in my world right now. And I'll usually tell a story about, it could be a story about my, my dog August, or could be about anything. Um, sometimes. And then I usually will do a callback later in the, later in the, in the sort of letter portion of it or the essay portion, I guess is another way to think about it. Um, so a callback is another one for me, a callback, just referencing something that happened earlier, sometimes in a kind of tongue in cheek or funny way is another way. Um, let me th see. Thinking about vocabulary is, is important to me too. Um, I, I sort of like just using quirky words. I'm kind of a quirky writer, right? And so I use quirky words to express that. So that's why I have a department of shenanigans, for example, you know, I could, I could call it the department of the absurd, but shenanigans is a word that I love. You know, it just is like, it just like screams fun, right? It just screams something that's a little bit crazy. So thinking through word choice, I think is another, another uh, way that I, that I layer in voice as well. Yeah. I'm realizing we have another thing in common. In, oh, in that, uh, you have, we both have loved ones named August. My son is named August. Yes, <laughs> you, that's, right. August. that's right. I think you, did you mention that to me? Cause I feel like I knew that. I don't know. I don't remember when we talked about that. Um, you had one last thing that you were going to say word choice. I don't know. I think, I think, I guess what the, the bigger point that I was making is that I just, I want it to be inherently readable. Like I want it to feel like a fun ride from the beginning to the end, you know? Yeah. You know? So, um, so even doing some things that are, are sort of design choices, I think feed into voice. So playing with, um, with white space, like tons of white space, tons of, um, of subheads, you know, just making it really, making it very readable, I think is just, you know, a, just a, a smart way to go. You don't like, I don't want 1400 words to feel like 1400 words. I want it to feel like you get to the end and, and, you know, and that was a good time. So. Yeah. Well, I think you, you carry that all the way through, which, um, is really good. And, and that's what we can segue into is where people should go to subscribe, but just in the name of your newsletter being called total anarchy, um, anarchy with two ends in this case. Uh, and that's, that's up there with shenanigans, just as far as great words that should be, <laughs> should be used all the time. And so people know what to expect and, and you're just carrying that voice through. Where should people go to subscribe to Total Anarchy and uh, follow you on the web? Yeah, anhanley.com slash newsletter. You can subscribe right there. Um, yeah, subscribe right there. And uh, everybody subscribes gets a free puppy. All right. I love it. You can join the 21,000 people who love 
the newsletter and the 21,000 people who, <laughs> who knows what they think about it. That's crazy. I have to thank you for pointing that out to me. You're welcome. Website two way is something I can do. Well, I only bring it up because someone went through my site and we have like some numbers about ConvertKit uh, on like my own site. And it's one of those exact sort of things where it's like in the about page somewhere. And it was just like wildly out of date. Like the company is twice the size that I was saying then. And someone's like, you might want to update this. And I was like, oh, I forgot that's, a, that's there. <laughs> you know, another word that I like is nincompoop. And I would use that for myself at this point because I really should have changed that. So, yeah, well. Well, now you can. Well, Anne, thanks for coming on. This has been really fun. Yeah, it was a lot of fun. Thank you so much for having me. And um, yeah, it's been a pleasure. Yeah.